I am so happy you chose to join us again this week. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we come again asking that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive you afresh as we study your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we are still on the harmony of the law and the gospel. And our author writes, we believe that the law of God is the eternal and unchangeable rule of his moral government that it is holy, just, and good, and that the inability which the scripture ascribes to fallen men to fulfill its precepts arises entirely from their love of sin, to deliver them from which and to restore them through a mediator to unfeigned obedience to the holy law is one great end of the gospel and of the means of grace connected with the establishment of the visible church. So we're still continuing today in Galatians, the third chapter, verses 19 through 25. And this is the NIV version. It says, what then was the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was put into effect to angels by a mediator. A mediator, however, does not represent just one party, but God is one. Is the law, therefore, opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin, so that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. So last time, we looked at why Paul felt the necessity to write this letter to the Church of Galatia. They, they were, in essence, confused about the harmony of the law and the gospel. When two things are in harmony, that means that they are in perfect agreement. One complements the other. They're not necessarily the same, but they fit together nicely. It's like peanut butter and jelly. It, it's like watching an ice skating duo that makes you go, ah, because it's, it's, it's such a beautiful sight to see. The law and the gospel is like that. The law shows us how messed up we are while the gospel steps in and says, I got you. The law is a heavy yoke and the, the gospel bears that yoke and sets us free. One does not do away with the other. They work in harmony. The gospel of Jesus Christ frees us from the yoke of the law. The book of Galatians deals with the mistaken thinking that salvation can be earned by keeping a set of rules. And it also deals with the fact that those who receive salvation must live by God's rules. Paul in Galatians is not arguing against being law-abiding people. No, as Christians, we should be some of the best people in society. We should be the easiest people to get along with. When, when one of the teachers of the law asks Jesus of all the commandments which is the greatest you know trying to test him and jesus responded in matthew 22 and 37 he says you should love the lord your god with all your heart with all your soul with all your mind then as jesus often did he gave them what they did not ask for but needed to know in, in verse 39 and 40 he says and the second is like it you shall love your neighbor as yourself on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophet. So Paul is not arguing that Christians should not be law-abiding citizens. He was arguing against legalism. And there is a difference. Uh, an easy demonstration, you know, is the best I can give you. An easy analysis of, of, of to demonstrate the law versus legalism would be that of a parent-child relationship. Legalism 
would be demonstrated by a home in which the child has to earn the parent's love. You know, they got to stick to a bunch of rules, strict rules and regulations. And, and, and in that family, there's rules for everything and, and that would govern the child's behavior. And if the child broke any of the rules, then the parent would withhold their love from the child. And there would also be harsh punishments for the child. You know, in that family, love has to be earned. So the, the children, the child would constantly be working, trying to live up to the parent's expectation in order to receive love. That would be based on that in that family, love is based on performance and that would be legalism. When you have to perform in order to receive, that's legalism. Then the flip side, which is would be the, the law abiding, uh, it, it, it could be seen in the home where the parents love the children unconditionally, but at the same time, they teach the children that they expect a standard of behavior. You know, we all grew up in families that most of us did anyway, that, that certain, certain actions was expected of us because we were part of the family. We didn't have to do a certain thing to be in the family, but because we were part of that family, certain standards were, were, were expected. And, and so, and then when you fail to live by those standards, then the parents would lovingly correct the child and require a change of behavior. So, but the child was always loved and the child was always guided through life lovingly. That's how God loves his children. His love is unconditional. We can't earn it. He gives it to us freely. But at the same time, he doesn't just let us run loose. Uh, it, it, we, certain things are expected because we are part of his family. There are rules or certain behaviors that are expected of his children, not to receive love, but because we are his child. God rules for his children can be better understood or, or by, if, if we call them household rules. Every functional family has rules that are to be adhered to. And, and just like in our earthly family, our children at times break the rules. So is the case in God's family. We don't always live up to his standards. We sin. And when we do, God lovingly corrects us and requires that we change our behavior. God does not want us to just be running, running wild. And, and you know, we, we've all seen, especially toddlers or children, running wild. And, and who do we look at? We look at the parents. And, and so God does not want us, he, he wants us to be good, upstanding citizens. And, and God can do that or he can, he can be merciful to us because of the gospel, which ushered in grace. The law was strict and unbending. With the law, there was no grace, there was no mercy. It required total obedience or death, and there was no in between. And so in Galatians, the third chapter, verse 19, Paul asks and answers a question. He says, what then was the purpose of the law? That's the question. And then he answered. He said, it was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was put into effect through angels by a mediator. Now, remember from last week's lesson, Paul is defending the gospel. Remember some false teachers had come to the church and was preaching that the Gentiles had to become Jews and obey the law in order to be saved. And so with that as a backdrop, Paul asked the question, what was the purpose of the law? You know, it, it wasn't to, for the, for, for the, the, the Gentiles to become Jews. The purpose of the law, it was added because of transgressions or sin. And it was 
to be temporary or just until a certain time. Paul says it was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. So it was never meant to be a permanent thing. And it was never meant to make us acceptable to God. The law had a, a course to run. And once it was done, it was to be set aside. Again, that does not mean that the door is then open for loose living. It should lead us. The law's purpose was to lead us to, to, to become a part of God's family through Christ Jesus. And in God's family, there are standards that we are to live by. I read that verse again, verse 19. I read it again and put emphasis in, in certain spots. It, it says, it was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. When Jesus Christ came, the law was to be set aside. The law was meant to have a only a temporary purpose and only a temporary lifespan. It was to extend only from Moses to Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the seed to whom the promise referred to. He is the seed to whom the promise of righteousness was given. God never intended the law to be a way of salvation. It was only for temporary, uh, the temporary purpose of showing us our sin and how awful we are. Right here, I should point out that because the law was temporary until Christ came, that does not mean that the law has no value for us today. We can't just take the law out of the Bible and be done with it. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. Therefore, he embodies the law. In Jesus, we see what the law looks like. He personifies the law. I'm one of those people that need to see how things, you know, I need to see how things are. I need to see somebody actually doing a thing uh, for me to believe that it is possible or that I can do it. It's like before I joined the Air Force, almost 45 years ago, I, I needed to see that females could do it. it it's like, because I, I, I heard like, uh, the military is not for females. Oh, it's going to be hard for females. You know, I heard all that stuff. So I needed to see females in the Air Force doing it. So I observed other females that were doing it and doing it successfully. And that gave me the confidence to that I needed to join the Air Force. When we look at Jesus, we see the perfection of his nature and, and that perfection includes the righteousness of the law. In Jesus Christ, we see what the law looks like. We see a perfect righteousness. The law and its righteousness is part of his nature. See, the law has a righteousness that could be earned if a person could obey it to the latter. But only Jesus could do that. Only Jesus could live a perfect life and do all that the law required. So to cut the law out of the Bible would be to erase part of our understanding of Jesus Christ and part of his very nature. To do that, we would only have a partial truth. But to explain that would take more time than we have for this lesson. So join us next week as we continue to walking, as we continue walking our way through the harmony of the law and the gospel. And until then, see you. Have a fantastic week. Be safe and come back and join us next week. Bye-bye.